Are you looking for an inexpensive way to host plugins for your live console and be able to change the scenes and settings all at once with just a click of the mouse? Live Professor 2 has you covered, and today I'm gonna walk you through how to set it up. Hey, if you're new here, my name's James, and I help church sound techs make every worship mix an enjoyable one so people can focus on Jesus. If that's you, go ahead and hit subscribe and ding the little bell to get notified every time I post new content. Go ahead, you don't have to be scared. The notification bell isn't gonna hurt you. There are a lot of reasons that you might wanna use plugins on your live console. Vocal tuning, dynamic EQ, and DSing are all things that are really handy, but not every console has it built in. Some companies make a virtual rack that you can use, but those are limited to just the plugins that they make. Now, if you're recording your multi-track audio with a digital audio workstation, you can insert your plugins there and return the channels back to your console. But one thing that I love about Live Professor 2 is the ability to use cues and snapshots to quickly recall a bunch of plugin settings all at once. This is especially handy for changing the key on a bunch of different vocal tuning plugins all at the same time. To get to and from the computer, you've got some options. If your console has multi-channel capabilities over USB, that's the simplest way to go. I mean, it's hard to get simpler than a USB cable. Now, if you don't have that, it is possible to come out of the console's outputs into an audio interface to the computer and then back out that same audio interface to the console on another pair of analog inputs. Now, before you start nerd shaming me, wait. Does it add some more noise? Yeah. Does it introduce a little bit of latency? Mm -hmm. Are there more DA and AD conversions that are necessary? Yeah. Do I think it matters? Mm, not that much. Now, another option you can choose is to use Dante as inserts. Now, if it's built into your console already, awesome, you're good to go on that end. But getting it to the computer requires either a PCIe card or the virtual sound card license. It just receives the Dante signal over your ethernet port. The only thing that I don't love about it is that it requires four to 10 milliseconds of latency. So if you keep the latency low, you're gonna tax your DSP on your computer. But if you keep the latency high, you're gonna have to deal with a lot more latency. This is one of the reasons I prefer an audio interface over Dante. You may now get out your nerd shaming pitchforks and torches and roast me in the comments for this. Actually, if you're following me so far, go Go ahead and type nerd shaming in the comments down below. Now on the console side, you can use the channels direct out or insert send to get to the computer and then use either the insert return or another channel on the console to return it in a different spot. Now you might be wondering why I'd take up double the amount of channels that I'd be processing. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that sometimes you want an unaffected signal to go to the monitors. If you use the channel insert and the computer crashes, all of a sudden you're gonna have no signal coming in on probably your most important inputs of all. Then you have to figure out what went wrong, scramble to bypass the insert on all these really important channels and do it under stress. My blood pressure's rising just thinking about it. A workaround for this would be to create a snapshot that only recalls the insert return state on those channels. Depending on your console, you can filter some of the functions and not all of them that your scene will recall. I'd also want this scene recallable by a user defined button that's labeled panic because it's most likely that you're using these to insert on vocals and your vocals are your most important input. I mean, it's all about the low end, but nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. And if you wanna to listen to instrumental worship music, just go to Chick-fil-A. What I prefer, if you have enough channels, is to return the live professor outputs back onto another set of input channels. This way, if things crash and get stressful, you can use your gross motor skills of shoving up the other faders rather than the fine motor skills of hunting for the right scene to recall or bypassing the insert on all of those channels but let's be honest, you still will break into a cold sweat. Now, when it comes to gain structure, you'll want to set the preamp on the channel that's sending to Live Professor, not the one that's returning to it if you're using another analog input. If you are, you'll wanna match the gain so that the same level coming into the input channel is coming back into the return channel. This way you're not adding or subtracting any gain on the second route in. Also, you'll want some basic EQ and compression set up on the send channel, but you'll send the direct out before all that processing. Most consoles will let you do that. You might have to find the manual to figure out exactly where to send that pickoff point when you're setting it up. If you're using an audio interface, you'll wanna set your inputs to line level because you've already used your console's mic pre to boost that level up from mic level all the way up to line level. That's what the mic preamp on the console is for. So you don't wanna run into another gain stage on your audio interface. You'll also wanna take a look at your device's hardware buffer. This is how many samples it's gonna to take to process the signal. And the lower the number, the more DSP it 
takes, but the lower latency you get. We'll talk a little bit more about latency in a minute, so stay tuned for that. One more thing that you'll have to look out for is the monitor level knob on your audio interface. A lot of manufacturers assume that you're gonna be going from output channels one and two to some monitor speakers, so they put a level control on there. Then if this gets turned down, then your level coming back into your console is gonna get trimmed down as well. And that's gonna mess up all your gain structure. You then turn up the other preamp, it adds noise. It's not gonna be a good thing. So just watch out for that if you have that on your audio interface. When you start Live Professor, you should scan for plugins before you begin setting things up. That way you actually have something to insert on your channel paths. I'm gonna make the assumption that you've already installed your plugins before running Live Professor for the first time. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. It can also be helpful to know what folder they got installed into. Then you'll want to make sure that it's looking at the right audio interface to get the signal from your console. Now that you've done that, you can create a new path for which to put your plugins. At this point, we'll do our audio routing so we can tell Live Professor which input to look at and then which output to send it to when we're done. If you get confused with the matrix that looks like Minesweeper, you can go ahead and hit the wires tab. This will show you a visualization of what's connected to what and how it's getting where. Now it is possible to double patch the input straight to the output and send it through the plugin path at the same time, which creates this weird chorusing effect and it makes people sound like a robot. You can go ahead and ask me how I know. Always check the wires tab to make sure that this didn't happen. Now you can start adding plugins to each plugin chain. Now, if you're gonna do vocal tuning, I suggest that you put that first so that you have the lowest noise floor. Unless you're in a studio, other instruments are gonna bleed into your vocal mic. So if you compress it first and then send it to the vocal tuning, you've raised the noise floor of those other instruments that are bleeding in. This can cause a note from an instrument to trigger the vocal tuning and bend that in a way that you might not want on your lead vocal. And that'll make a sound tech solo in a hurry. So if you're still with me, go ahead and type sound tech solo in the comments below. Now that we have all our plugins inserted on all the channels, let's figure out how to change the key on the vocal tuning on each one with just a click. The way I set it up is with 12 global snapshots one for each key, and another one that says bypass, that just totally bypasses the plugin. Because the only thing that's worse than out of tune vocals is vocals that are tuned to the wrong key. You don't wanna do that, so I just made it easy. If you get confused, hit bypass, it bypasses all the tuning, and you'll be okay. If you wanna avoid that mistake, just mash that thumbs up. Now, as a matter of preference, I like to slow down the tuning speed and the note change speed just a little bit. That way, if somebody has a big vocal scoop, it doesn't turn it into a stair step, which could be really distracting. So if we hold down control, click and drag, then it will copy to the next plugin. We're already in B flat, and it's already got the speed changes going on. So we can see both of these up here. Close those. Now, we're in B-flat, so we're gonna make a global snapshot. I'm gonna call it B-flat major. And we've got this global snapshot. Now I can go through here on each one of these, and let's go to B major. Now I'm gonna save this global snapshot. Then we can go to C major on everybody. Now, if we wanna change the order of these, we can drag them around, make it so that we go back. And if you decide that you wanna make a change to the tuning speed, you can update each snapshot by loading it, changing the speed and hitting the U button. This will update the selected snapshot so that you can make those changes and they'll save globally instead of doing it all for one song and then it all changes on another song when you change keys. Is it tedious to make that change across all 12 keys on every single channel that's got vocal tuning? Yeah, but if it was easy, they wouldn't need us. That's why they pay us with coffee and donuts. Now what happens when you have other plugins in the chain that are doing EQ or dynamics processing and you don't wanna to have to update those or save them to a snapshot every single time you make a change. Now that would get a little too tedious for me. You can hit this button here to keep the plugins from being changed by the automation. Otherwise, all the work you did would get undone. And that's no fun. 
Should I grow a man bun? To make things even easier to change from song to song, I'll load up several cues, one for each song, so that I can switch between them and the key will automatically change. That way I don't have to think, what song are we going to and what key is it in? I just think, oh, we're on that song now, go. To make a new set of cues, hit the little plus sign here. Now create a new cue and then drag this little icon here to say I want it to recall a global snapshot. You can rename the cue as the song and now double clicking it will load that global snapshot and you're good to go. To make this even simpler, you don't have to delete and recreate the cues every time. You can just change which key they recall and rename it. If you have to add another one week to week, fine, or you can delete it. Now the thing to remember is that blue means the cue is active, green means it's on deck. If you just wanna hit one button, you tap that go next and it'll go to the green one. Now after you get all this set up, be sure to save it and save it as a template. You don't wanna to have to redo your work all over again. There's also a checkbox in the settings menu that will reload the previous settings when you close Live Professor and that can be really handy too, but you don't wanna rely on that. Go ahead and save your work. Some plugins cause more latency than others. If it's a low latency plugin, you'll probably be okay, but if it creates more latency, you're gonna have to deal with that somehow. If all of your channels are going through Live Professor, you can group them so that the latency is consistent between all of them. But if some of your channels are going through Live Professor and others aren't, you'll have to compensate for that delay someplace else, like on your board. There are input delay controls that you can set, and you can set it to match the latency that you see on Live Professor. So you can see the delay time is right here. We've got 1.3 milliseconds of delay, and you can see which plugin is causing that delay. Now let's add something that's got a lot more delay. And you can see that when we open the vintage tape, this goes to 51.8 milliseconds. That's a pretty long time. So what we can do is group the other plugins to have the same amount of delay as this one. So we would go to output delay and time align group, and we would set it to group number one. We do that on the other channels, also set to the same group. And now you can see we've got 51.8 milliseconds of delay because of this plugin here. Now if I remove this plugin, now our delay time goes back down. This also shows you the amount of delay that you would need to set on your console if you set it up that way. Now your musicians won't want latency in their monitors because that can throw them off and throw off their timing. You can either get a separate monitor console or have different channels for the returns coming back from Live Professor. But that begs the question, how much latency is too much latency? And when are the people in the audience going to start to notice? Well, let's think about this. 10 milliseconds of latency is about the same acoustic latency that you get from the speed of sound traveling about 10 feet. The speed of sound is 1130 feet per second. And so if we divide that out, we get about 1.1 feet per millisecond. I think I did my math right there. Now, are you bothered by hearing a sound delay that's 10 milliseconds later? Probably not. People are already sitting more than 10 feet away from the speakers. So if they're sitting 20 feet away or 30 feet away, that's not gonna really mess with their brain on how much latency they're hearing. But there does come a point where they do hear it. And if you're a super nerd and wanna chat with me in the comments about it, I love to hear about it. If you love taking your church's audio team to the next level, I have a guide for you called How to Lead Your Church Sound Team. It's totally free and you can find it through the link in the description below. Don't forget to like this video, share it with a friend, Hit subscribe and ding the little bell so that you can get notified every time I post new content. And remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time.